Thank you all for sticking through the whole day with us. And I know it takes a lot. And one of these, you know, in a few hours, we'll actually get to go outside, <laughs> which will be nice and defrost a little bit. Um, so pretend like that gap didn't just happen, because I think that last question from Ursula, that last response from Brian, actually leads really nicely into this next panel discussion. Um, and I hope we'll get to go deeper in, into that. Um, so really digging in deeper in solutions, thinking about policy, systems changes, institutionalized practices, um, power and equity in the context of uh, rural, a rural conversation is where we want to go now with this great panel and, and the conversation that unfolds after that. Um, so as we think about this, we, we in our healthy communities work think a lot about the unfair systems, policies, and practices such as residential segregation, inadequate access to quality health care, a lot of other practices that have been talked about throughout the course of the day already um, that create systemic barriers to opportunity and to good health um, in so many communities. And these communities then are less likely to have economic stability and opportunity for health and well-being for generations to come. This has really long-term implications. And so what we're hoping that this panel is gonna really talk about is the incredible work across the country and the fundamental drivers that, that will bridge opportunity in a, in a much more long-term vision way, thinking about the power structures, the institutional practices that are really important drivers of that. Um, and so, who better than Whitney Kimball Coe to moderate this conversation that's really um, at the heart of it meant to tackle this question about how can we build a more inclusive nation. And so Whitney, as the na national or the director of national programs at the Center for Rural Strategies and leading the Rural Assembly, has agreed to jump in at the last moment um, to moderate this conversation, but it's just such a perfect fit for it. So pleased to have all of you here. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Am I on? Can we hear me okay? Excellent. Yeah, this conversation's about to get real now. Um, <laughs> all real. Um, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be up here. Uh, I'm, it's true I'm not um, Manal Capagoda from Change Labs. Um, I'm Whitney Kimball Coe from the Center for Rural Strategies and the Rural Assembly. And our tagline is, let's build an inclusive nation, a more inclusive nation. Um, one that's greener, smarter, more prosperous, and includes all the people and all the places. Um, and I think this is a really important panel and that we've been teed up really well um, to be one of the final um, sets of voices you hear up on this stage today, so don't blow it, guys. Let's get it <laughs> right. Um, we, need some, we need some really good uh, solutions, uh, policy-focused and, and systems-focused, of course. And I loved... Um, one of the things that Ed Sivak, one of the many things you said this morning that really resonated with me and I think sets a good tone for this panel is this piece about how um, the gaps, these gaps that we see, these disparities we see, they didn't happen by accident necessarily, right? Um, they're the results of policies or the lack of policies, good policies, the, the breakdown of systems that don't, either don't serve us anymore or never served us very well. Um, something else that uh, I heard recently from uh, my mentor, Krista Tippett, um, uh, she was talking about how we are living in a world right now that is um, built in 20th century structures, but we're facing 21st century problems, and the imagination is there if we are willing to tap into it for how we bridge, how we make um, uh, rural America uh, a 21st century solution and, and leadership effort um, for the nation. And I look at all of at this panel and I think, yes, this is, this is a good group for everyone to hear from. To introduce them, though, I'd, I'd like to just go down the line, perhaps, starting with you, Rita, um, and invite you to tell us your kind of rural story, your connection to rural. America. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. It's, it's great to be on the panel with such distinguished experts. Um, and to be here today in, in Charleston, West Virginia, it's the first time that I've ever been here. So it's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful country. 
Um, so my story in terms of how I'm connected to rural America really derives from my own father who um, came to the United States through the Bracero program back in the 50s. And if you talking about policies and practices, um, the Bracero program was a program that the United States uh, back in the 50s uh, did an agreement with Mexico to bring labor workers to come work the land um, in up and down Central America and a number of different regions across the country. And so as a, as a young uh, Latino Mexican uh, immigrant uh, who worked the land. He also suffered from a lot of food insecurity and overcrowding and housing, and um, but also learned a lot in that space and, and um, saw this country as a great opportunity um, to, to raise a family and, and, um, and later turned into con construction in, in suburban America for me. Uh, and, and for me, I remember a lot of those stories coming from my father of, of of just uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of great friendships uh, in, in working the land, um, but also you know recognizing that food insecurity is a big issue, that overcrowding and housing conditions continue to be uh, a major issue. And 50 years later, when I when I sit here and I think about um, you know the same similar stories of of Samuel P Perez from um, Immokalee, Florida, who is a kindergartner. Uh, that works at, or oh, that works, but he um, is a child of a migrant and seasonal farm worker family uh, and um, has been suffering from, from tooth decay for over six months. And some of the work that we've been doing with our affiliates, with uh, the Red Lens Christian Migrant Association, uh, is bringing uh, young children like him uh, to get access to dental and medical homes. Um, and this is through the Migrant Head Start programs that a lot of the children that are early childhood education programs, if you're familiar with, with that program, is linking them to better health care uh, and better education. Uh, and so we're working with about eight affiliates across the country, not only in Florida and California, Washington, Arizona, uh, Utah, and Texas. Uh, in, in rural com communities, specifically around um, migrant and seasonal farm workers, to help them link that connection with the community health centers and the Migrant Head Start programs um, through our Healthy and Ready for the Future uh, initiative. And for me, that stands out a lot in terms of the many stories that we hear from the children that are being seen, um, but also from the families, just like Samuel, who lives with um, in a small, clean, mobile unit with seven other adults, six children, um, but very happy and resilient and, and knowing that now that he has access to oral health care, he's able to be, actually even teach all the other students in his class about the importance of flossing and he, he prides himself of now having two coronas which are crowns and so that's, for me, it's the, all these stories about our children um, in rural America is what brings me here today. Ah, his lock, his whisper, Nicky Petrie, his chin, this whisper, Quille, chin streets, umsh, and cheats it sits in her, chief book, Hangary, chief Ignis, chief Kamek, and Hill Chief Lashai. Ah, he nuni is chin, this whisper, Yoskape Hill, and she baby girl is whisper, Appleton, Raymond's it, and um, Aki dot doque, chin, you que, you que eat. My name is Nicky Petrie, I'm a member of the Cordelian tribe. My Indian name is Meadowlark, and um, in our ways, if you want to know who I am, I need to tell you who my relatives are. And I'm a direct descendant of four chiefs who I'd said my mother's name is Snowbird, and my daughter's name is Carries the Medicine. And I said, um, I care for our next generation. <coughs> and I work at the Aspen Institute, so I'm really happy to see a familiar face of Janet here. But I am the associate director, and I guess my story of what my, my role I guess in rural America, um, I'm a true product of my community. Uh, like I said, I'm a member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. The tribal lands traditionally span from eastern Washington into western Montana. And present day, we're located on a plot of land in North Idaho, just south of the city of Coeur d'Alene. And um, I was raised to believe that the mountains are our grandfathers, that our water is sacred, and that the trees you know, <clears throat> protect us and that, you know, we can learn so much from nature and the land that we live on. And carrying those, <clears throat> not necessarily as concepts, but truths, and part of my miyep, and my language miyep means that core lifelong lesson. Um, it's something that's within me, and I try to carry that with me in the work that I do, 
um, at the Aspen Institute on behalf of uh, Native youth. So that's just a little bit about myself, and then I'll share more about my work in a little bit. So let me mention to Spoos. Thank you. Try it again. Hi. There you go. Um, I live in Winston Salem. Uh, let's see. Our work uh, is a lot about community economic development and a democracy in the Deep South. Uh, so I spend maybe two thirds of my time in uh, our work in the rural South. Uh, before that, um, I ran a community economic development organization in Appalachian, uh, Kentucky, and we did a lot of work in as central Appalachia, so I spent a lot of time in rural Appalachia in that context. And as I think about, uh, about rural uh, communities, I think sense of humor is one of my favorite <laughs> things, and I think about a lot of people that, I, that are important uh, to me who sort of define the way they show up through, uh, uh, you know, humor. D is one, <laughs> I think. Joe Begley, Ed, uh, uh, all the people that um, uh, were part of my work in rural communities, but also um, always thought it was okay to make fun of everybody in the room if you made fun of yourself first. And it, uh, I always um, loved it, but it was one of those things you had to be careful not to get wrong, right? Where, where, where you can't exactly um, do that incorrectly. Uh, so I, um, I uh, yeah, so that's all. That's great. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kara James, and I'm the director of the CMS Office of Minority Health. And um, my connection to rural, I would say professionally, is through the focus on vulnerable populations that we have in our office and also as co-chair of the CMS Rural Health Council. And I would say my connection in personal capacity is probably like Rita's in sort of a, a shared ancestry. Um, my uh, On my maternal side, we have less information on my, my father's side, but on my maternal side, my great-great-great-grandfather uh, was born in South Carolina, um, so we are part of that slave heritage in the Black South that Dante presented a little while ago. Um, and we resided there. We didn't quite make the migration um, that happened, the Great Migration in the early 20th century, so we still have family who are in the South. Um, I am a, a landowner in the South. We don't grow tobacco anymore because that's not quite what we're supposed to do, but um, we grow soybeans. Um, but also, you know, sort of really having family that's still there, family that experience health disparities. Uh, we have, you know, community, a, a cousin who is still living in the same gravel two-lane road of her community and won't ask the county to pave it because she doesn't want to create problems, doesn't want to start trouble. Um, so that house has been there since 1951, mm. um, not paved. But um, I think that you know that sense of, of vulnerability but also the needs that are there in the community, uh, we see those in our family. Um, had a, a family member who um, actually had a stroke from sickle cell living in the rural community, didn't quite get the care that they needed, and um, unfortunately passed away at 34. So um, we see a lot of that. We also have the fun, uh, the sense of humor, the expressions that are there, and um, the entrepreneurial nature. My grandfather was a, a moonshiner, so um, it's quite, <laughs> quite challenging and fun. That's great. Thank you all for sharing a little bit about yourselves and your personal stories and connections to rural places. I think that's really apt in a conversation about systems change and policy, right? Because we know that perception and stories and narrative, of course, drive, um, drive policy and drive investment. And they drive the way we think about how we self or how we correct systems. Um, and today we has been rich um, in story and narrative, and you all have had some time perhaps to be listening to those stories and thinking about your own and your own work that you do and how that is, informs how you approach policy change and systems change. So I'd like to ask each of you to spend a few minutes telling us, giving us an example perhaps, or uh, you know, in your wildest dreams, what sort of policy or systems change could, could put us on a better path. Um, or, or help close those gaps that we've been talking about. Shall we go back this way, like 
start just yeah just to um, so I'm a Fed, so we don't advocate for policies mm -hmm. <laughs> particularly. But I think you know, in looking at rule and, and thinking about the conversation, so we know that rule is not a monolith. And I think that one of the things that we also know is that there isn't going to be one policy that fixes everything. Mm -hmm. So what I think we've heard a lot today, what we've heard in our listings that we've done as we've been going out in the communities is the need for flexibility. Um, to allow for communities to be able to show what works for them and to be able to put that in place, but that there needs to be some support to make that happen. Um, and so one of the things that I, I do get concerned about when we think about um, vulnerable communities is the kind of potential to sort of piecemeal it together, sort mm -hmm. of community by community. That means that some communities that may not have the bandwidth and capacity could be left behind. Um, so how do we make sure that we're connecting them and making sure that they have the resources? There's a lot that's there, but there also are some communities that really are struggling, and how do we make sure that they have what's needed through our, our policies and programs? Um, I think we heard earlier today some of the things from a health perspective around you know, telehealth and other opportunities, but we need to think as well about workforce. Um, the education is so important uh, that I, think that, you know, how do we train the workforce to be able to stay in the community, to have the jobs that are there, um, but also to meet those needs. And one of the areas that we're very focused on is, of course, the sort of hospital closures and what that mm -hmm. means for access to care, not just from a point of an emergency, but also the ability to have access to preventive services. Mm -hmm. So um, I will stop there. I think to uh, start where Brian left off, I just think the question on in my mind is not really a policy question, it's a power question. It's okay. how do we help support rural communities to build a power to advance uh, you know, all of the range of policy ideas that we have a lot of evidence actually can make a difference. Um, if I had to pick a policy, Medicaid expansion I think is a good one. There's lots of evidence even in um, red states, uh, Idaho, Utah, Nebraska have all passed uh, expansion and hundreds uh, of thousands of uncovered uh, people um, now have health care. And part of that, in my mind, is some explicit acknowledgement of, uh, uh, of power and figuring out what it takes to put together a coalition that isn't about politics but is about a set of ideas and how do you advance a quality of life that uh, is important. And um, an example in North Carolina, NCE Child is an advocacy organization that I think has used a set of strategies um, to advance a policy idea, but really to create relationships across um, actors important to pass complicated ideas. So uh, they have formed strategic relationships with the Farm Bureau, insurance companies, the North Carolina Hospital Association, grounded in trying to understand the he, a research and the economic impacts of Medicaid expansion in the state. Um, they also have held 10 community um, 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 uh, uh, gatherings, really conversations, across uh, he, he, rural parts of the state uh, really anchored in building relationships with local people to hear their stories, their healthcare challenges, and what would access to healthcare uh, mean to them. Um, and they were smart about which communities they held those conversations in. So those uh, relationships um, could translate into conversations with uh, other important people in those uh, communities. Um, they also then did uh, targeted ad buys in those communities telling stories about what um, access to health care um, means economically uh, and in terms of individuals' um, 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 lives. So I just think there's a um, reality that isn't just about what's the right policy, but it's really about what does it look like to create relationships to get proximate to the, the, the issues and uh, he impacted um, the people and um, make the connections necessary to uh, build influence that can uh, 
make a difference um, in policy. I guess kind of um, aligned with what Justin had just said, we at the Center for Native American Youth, we were founded by Senator Byron Dorgan of North Dakota in 2011, uh, who used a million dollars of his unused campaign funds to create the Center for Native American Youth um, on the foundation of addressing Native youth suicide. And <clears throat> what you may not know is that Native youth, um, unfortunately, Indian country, it's like 3.5 times the national average. And I, I carry that with me because I've had family that's been, um, that's been impacted by suicide. And from there, we've grown to four pillars of work. And I think that one per of particular interest, especially over here, is policy change. And we make sure that Native youth are at the forefront of policy change, whether it's preparing, um, I actually wrote out some names. So a first generation tribal college student, Del Kerfman, who's advocating to Congress for the Future Act, which will help better uh, equipped Little Bighorn College to have um, student support services, library services, and curriculum development at his college or Mariah Gladstone of the Blackfeet Nation to advocate in front of the Senate on behalf of food, uh, her food sovereignty initiative, or even um, Kyra Antone working with her and her cabinet of the Native American Women's Association at Washington State University to change the city of Pullman, uh, Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. So those are the kind of policies that we work on that we're making sure that youth are at the forefront, they have the tools and resources that they need because they're going to be the best advocates for themselves. Um, it, it was like what was said on the previous panel, we want to provide youth the opportunity and tools that they need so they become, become, they can be the best advocates in their communities. Yeah, um, I would like to echo not only Nikki, but Justin's and, and Cara's points in terms of when we think about policies, uh, especially for the Latino community, I think it's important to note that we also suffer the same <laughs> outcomes, you know, and 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 challenges in terms of having affordable housing or clean, you know, housing, um, ensuring that we have access to uh, health insurance, insurance that is culturally appropriate, language appropriate um, for our communities, um, ensuring that you know we're expanding Medicaid and full expansion of Medicaid um, so that our hospitals uh, don't have to close. Um, but also our community health centers, our federally qualified health centers. Unidos U.S. has a, a, a number of health centers that are affiliated with, with us in addition to um, the, the, their respective associations who largely see um, you know, communities um, both in migrant areas and the rural areas. And so the protection in terms of, of having that provider, that safety pro provider of care, uh, uh, clinicians and providers that know the communities. I think supporting community health workers um, is, is, is vitally important. I think we forget um, them as a trusted source in our communities. And it goes not only in the urban areas, but also in the rural areas. And many of the care that that um, you know Samuel received or, or other kids in our communities have largely been done because of the community health workers that have gone out into their homes or out in the community with health fairs and educated them about not only um, oral health, but in the last couple years, more about their rights, their rights as a human being, um, their rights as a, as a citizen. Of, of this country and and so there and that had to happen before they could even talk about health and so those are the realities that for our communities um, when we think about rural America it's also those shared values and ideas um, we all believe in having better access to care having better quality of life uh, you know when you look at the numbers of Latinos in rural America uh, while it's very diverse it's largely also Mexican immigrants that have come to this country because they wanted better jobs and better quality of life and even if you've seen I read some some work recently that um, if you have l larger uh, Latino uh, a proportion of Latinos in rural America, the economy is better of immigrants in terms of, of you know, bringing back um, economy vitalization in, in that community. And so 
I, I think education is a critical area for us in the Healthy Ready for the Future initiative that we have. It's only been in existence about three years, and what we wanted to do is make sure that we were um, supporting the health centers and the community-based uh, uh, organization that the migrant health systems to be able to do what they do best. Um, and how they do that best is how we support them and provide them with the funding uh, support. And it's, a, it's through a fundraising campaign, so I think you'll hear more on Thursday with Red Nose Day. All that money that is raised, we get a portion of that um, to support our affiliates in that space. But it, with even the, the last year, year and a half, we've been hearing a lot more of our, our providers about the need for trauma-informed care and thinking about the importance about how you show up with your kids and how kids are showing up in schools and how kids are showing up in their communities. And it's very difficult for them and the parents, whether it's family separation or other um, areas in, in terms of what poverty brings, right? And so for us, it's training our providers of how do you come in with a lens, with a trauma-informed lens, to better be able to support your child and be more mindful, um, you provide them a safe space to live, to learn, um, and to thrive in their own communities and for our future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, did anybody want to follow up on anything? Yes, good. So just one thing I wanted to um, follow up on when we think about uh, the policies, and I think it's also been a theme that has come throughout today and something that we're trying to work on across our work is really trying to apply that rural lens to our programs and policies. And so when we think about, and we've heard, you know, sort of the national policies, state policies, sometimes don't necessarily take rural into account and some of those differences, that it really is, um, we have to be intentional in that focus to look at both the needs of rural and also to think about how that plays out from an equity standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we apply that rural lens so that um, understanding one size doesn't fit all, how might this play out? Because there are, in a number of policies, it's not that there are you know, bad people out there trying to do things, but it has unintentional consequences that, things, that we may not have thought about because we're just trying to make policy for the the larger group. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, looking at states and some of the conversations that we've been having, I've been a little bit um, surprised in some of them that, you know, there isn't more of a lens that's being applied at sort of a state or sometimes local level. But I think that that's one way that if we think about how we are more intentional in applying that lens, we might have um, policies that are, are more helpful for rural communities. Thank you. Anyone else right now? I just want to follow up on this conversation about power and also about how we show up in spaces and how we're intentional about uh, using the rural lens, about how we make sure that communities of color and uh, more marginalized populations within rural are at the table. Have you all seen successful ways of doing that uh, policy or, um, uh, or examples where that is, that's happening? Have you seen that? So I have seen that through uh, two examples, two staple programs that we have at the Center for Native American Youth. One of them is called Champions for Change, where five youth are selected annually um, based off of the positive change that they're making in community, whether it's cultural language preservation, suicide prevention, drug and alcohol prevention. Um, and we work with them for a week in DC for what's called Champions Week. And we prepare them to meet with their members of Congress. They go to Capitol Hill and advocate on issues that are important to them. We do advocacy 101 training with them, communications. We teach our youth how to utilize social media as a platform to get their initiative across. And they're able to take the resources and things that they learned uh, from us home in, into their community. And we engage with them throughout the year. So that's Champions for Change. Uh, the second one is called Fresh Tracks, which brings together urban, rural, and tribal youth for a 72-hour immersive cross-cultural uh, learning experience through the outdoors. And we teach them about the power of sharing your personal narrative. And they work together to break down barriers. They do an implicit bias curriculum that's just absolutely amazing. And at the very end is community action. So what have they learned in this immersive experience that they can bring back home and CNAY, we're in the process right now of funding community action. So we're sending about you know anywhere from five hundred to thousand dollars to youth leaders who are participating in things such as I'm going to do a trash cleanup on my reservation. I want to do um, some culturally competent mural in this urban area, um, or on the MHA reservation. 
this young woman wants to teach men about the importance of growing their hair and what medicine that brings. So she's using her funds to buy a bunch of hair supplies, bringing in an elder, and them talking about the importance of hair. And I just, it's something that I'm really proud of, and I just would encourage anybody to just make sure that when it comes to civic engagement, that youth are just at the forefront of your minds, because it really is everything that we are doing is for that next generation. Yeah, I'd like to follow that up. I, I completely agree. I think youth are, are amazing. Uh, we, we've done a lot of work with with our youth through our uh, Power of 18. During the midterm elections, we launch a, a, a campaign um, through the high school democracy. We have a high school democracy project, which um, uh, it, it, uh, it's a curriculum for school teachers, but also it's a self-standing curriculum. So any organization, community organization that wants to take on this curriculum to learn about civic engagement and voter registration, it's, it's once they go through the curriculum, the, uh, the seniors, juniors and seniors, uh, they're able to, to register to vote and get them more civically engaged once they turn 18. So it's a Power of 18 campaign uh, that we've had um, that took off You know, during the midterm elections. We've done a lot of work in the civic engagement um, uh, work, not only through our Change Maker Summit, which is very similar to what Nikki has been doing with her youth and, and being able to train advocates to, to tell their stories um, and use their power as their voice, or their voice as their power, uh, go up to the hill, some of them for the first time, uh, and be able to tell their story um, from wherever country or uh, uh, community that they're from, uh, and and be able to help pass you know legislation in that space uh, within their own communities. We have a number of great cases and stories from leaders within our network who have become now um, part of boards, school boards, and one just recently ran for mayor uh, in Texas and won, and she's only 28 years old, and so these are the things that there's a lot of power in, in, in not only our, our, our youth, um, but also their voice and what the social issues that they care about. Um, we've done a lot of canvassing in this last election. Um, we, in the, even the state of Florida, we were able to register about 60,000 uh, individuals, eligible voters, to, um, to, to go to the polls. And so since we've started the work in, uh, on civic engagement in 2008, I think we've had about 600,000 uh, eligible voters. And and, and that's still growing because we've created an app to, to make it easier to register to vote. Um, and we've done a lot of canvassing. So I think those are some of the stories that you're starting to hear. But um, it could, it, when we start hearing from what our youth can do, it's, it's just the, um, the world's limit, or not the, your world's not your limit, or whatever that is. I'm not very good at a. The future is now. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes the future is now. So I think in terms of um, engagement, there we go. So um, there are a lot of things I th that are happening in a lot of different communities. And one of the things from our perspective is we're trying to get out in the communities more and to bring people to make that door open. So I think you know people think about the federal agency sometimes as a black box. And so having that point of contact where you can share what's happening in your community, we do you know, sort of the case study work and looking at um, specific issues, but also just the broader issues. And so that has been really helpful. I think people feel like they have now, at least when you say like CMS, they kind of have a sense a little bit of where to go. So that's one thing that we're trying to do is to create more of an open door, but also to get out in the community. So we, we do, definitely take our, our um, sort of road trips and particularly focused in rural communities to learn more about different issues. So we've gone, um, I've had the pleasure of going to Wisconsin doing a deep dive in rural graduate medical education, looking in uh, North Dakota and in South Dakota and different places. And I think that that's also helpful to break down some of those barriers to let people know that we're human. Um, and so we're here and trying to help out and creating some of those open doors so that people feel more welcomed to be able to share what's happening and can engage in a way, because it's one thing just to say you need to be engaged, but how do you mm -hmm. help empower people to be able to engage and to know how to do that? And I think those trainings are helpful, but also thinking about ways in which we can open more doors mm -hmm. for that participation. Mm -hmm. I would just add, um, probably not very interestingly, that we, like, we know a lot about how to engage people, and we just have to do it more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's a, hard and slow reality, but 
deep, complicated social change comes from uh, relationships. It comes from uh, community organizing. It comes from uh, engaging um, uh, people, understanding uh, the, 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 their stories, doing the leadership uh, development, uh, connecting them to you know, e either the policies or other systems that can be changed through exercising their, you know, um, um, will, whether it's through um, voting or, you know, directly through advocacy. There's a group in North Carolina that did um, 1,400 one-on-one -on -one interviews in two counties uh, with um, uh, 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 excuse me, with um, uh, the, the, a bunch of rural people, I'm a black and white. Um, for a lot of those um, folks, it was the first time they were asked their opinion about th th their life, what they cared about, what their concerns were, uh, you know, what they wanted, and they have been able to, through those conversations, bring that set of actors to a bunch of local policy change issues and then to the state house. And I just think that sort of on the ground effort to build connections, to understand the stories, to um, you know, uh, acknowledge the connections across a difference and then um, make sure those folks are part of and in an organized way an opportunity to change a policy, a system, or to, you know, put um, a pressure on, and he elected, that's where systems change and policy change uh, is from. And it feels like, as a foundation, we don't do enough of that uh, support of that hard, slow work that adds up. And um, mm -hmm. I believe we need to do more of it. Thank you. And I think the 30 second also just consistency. I think that right now, um, as I like to say, rural is the new black. So there's so much that's happening in rural, and it, you know, it speaks to the, the trendy <laughs> color, that everything that everybody's wear, wearing. But rural is the new black, and there's so much that's happening in rural. But I think there's also a lot of rural communities who feel like this is going to pass. Mm -hmm. And so the concern about what's actually going to be left once the new fad is over. Mm -hmm. And so I think how we, one of my concerns is that when, you know, that window does close and we move on, that we haven't made meaningful impact and change in that time. So how do we push that through? But part of that is also, as you know, Justin was saying, you've got to be consistent so that the community builds that trust and is willing to take a chance on you to make the change. Mm -hmm. Sure. Super quickly, census, obviously, it's coming up. It's a huge thing. Uh, I think as systems and policies uh, go, we're beginning to see interesting coalitions across the South come together of unusual partners, business, nonprofit, uh, and even uh, communities, uh, lots of organizing in the new immigrant community. Um, really trying to make the case of what it means to be counted and doing that in a way that uh, is sort of multi-sectoral, uh, you know, uh, describing the benefits to individuals in addition to, you know, what it means to have a new congressperson or whatever the opportunities are. But um, there's lots of good organizing of individuals, particularly new immigrants, um, who have lots to gain. And so I think the census is a real opportunity that none of us uh, should be blind to. Mm. Um, right before we transition to broader q and I have one more question that's a wild card that's not on our list. And if, if, you, if you'll indulge me, and I just want you know maybe one sentence from each of you just to wrap this up. I was just thinking about, as you all were talking, I heard... Gladys Washington speak recently at Berea College. Um, she works for the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, and she made this statement about um, if we, we all need to look within ourselves and decide how what our role is in addressing the inequities and the disparities that we see in the systems around us. What is my role? What is mine to do? I think we can sometimes get wrapped up in you know trying to to solve it all at once, but knowing that this is a long-term effort and we all have a role to play. I just wonder, you know, when you all wake up in the morning, what is, what is it that either A, gives you courage to keep doing the work you're doing, or what is that one thing that you feel like is yours to do right now? 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> um, not not too long. Just you know. Yeah, because you know yeah. you know all the issues. I don't need those U.S. covers, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think use your voice for good. Mm -hmm. I think that's and being brave, Be brave. every moment of the day. Um, I think Justin talked a lot about, oh, I guess I should be short, right? But I think he talked a lot about relationships, but also, and Dora did too, about um, kind of, you know, of showing up, but also in terms of making sure that we have a responsibility to provide a, a positive and accurate narrative of, of who we are and where we come from. Mm. That's important. Thank and not let others tell you which what you think you are. I think that was powerful from Sarah during the luncheon today. Thank you. For, uh, I guess what inspires me or what gets me up every morning is uh, knowing that the work that I'm doing is to pave a path for my daughter. And um, uh, on behalf of what Rita had said, I was raised where my mom uh, would ask me every day, if not you, then who? And so I bring that question to you as if not you, then who? I guess it's to uh, acknowledge all of the opportunity there is in the South. It's so easy to focus on uh, negative, and I just think there's incredible opportunity in the South in our rural communities that isn't to be blind to the challenges, but it's just to spotlight the real opportunities. My mortgage? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Me too. Right. Now you have to have a sense of humor. I, I think and th this is hard work. Um, and I think that this is work that we all know it's an uphill battle. And as I like to say, every now and then you get a picture of how steep the gradient is. Um, but I carry in my office a number of pictures from history that sort of remind me that ordinary people can make extraordinary changes. And if you just try and sort of also reflecting on the challenges that they had to overcome, I don't have problems. And I can, if they can do it, I can take a step in the right direction and try and make a difference. Thank you. All right, now we'll open it up. I'm sure there are many questions out there. Over here, and here's one, two. Hi, can you? No. There we Anna go. Hoover, University of Kentucky, uh, and I have had the privilege of working with the Systems for Action program uh, for several years. I have colleagues here from evidence for action, policies for action, health data for action, and, and all of those groups fund research. You started the panel talking about how narrative can help drive policy, but we also have to have evidence to drive policy, and I think, I think Joshua uh, uh, mentioned that, or Justin. So what I want to ask is, yeah. how do we address that system, the research system? Because rural populations are in need of evidence about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but you are at a disadvantage in partnering with a lot of the uh, large academic institutions that are, tend to be urban-based that have the capacity to write the research grants. So rather than focus on a gap or a need, I'm hoping you can share a story of a time that there was a partnership. You talked about relationship building. Uh, a time when there was a partnership uh, between your group, your community, um, your organization, and academic researchers that was able to move the needle on building evidence. Uh, and if you don't have that story, maybe an opportunity that you see for how we can change that system. So I'm going to um, call somebody out, but if Tom Morris wants to stand up from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, they fund rural research centers around the country to provide a lot of the evidence. And we, um, I can tell you, utilize that evidence. We've actually reached out to some of the research centers when we have questions to help inform some of our thinking and developing those policies. Um, so they are an amazing resource, and the Rural Health Information Hub has a lot of the work that's out there, but that's one where they are in working in the communities and they're scattered all over the country. So, Tom, if you want to raise your hand, you can. <laughs> <laughs> the RHA hub is where we're trying to build a rural community evidence base, but not like the NIH double-blind clinical trial. Okay, That's a little unsustainable uh, or unattainable at this point with our level of funding. But I do think that, like, just like today, we've heard a lot of great examples. How do we capture those? How do we put them in context? so that other people can replicate them. And then my partner in crime, the other side of the federal agency, so we have CMS, HRSA, and CDC, Diane Hall, 
uh, convened a group about a year and a half ago to look at what is the real evidence base and where are the gaps and how do we, how do we begin to start filling it. So if, if during the discussions anybody wants to talk about that, it's not up there, but imagine if it is. Uh, we'd love to talk more about the, how to build that evidence base in rural communities. Mm -hmm. We have one right here in the front. <laughs> or I could come stand next to you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, I, we've heard some of the talk about advocacy from, from Rita and Nikki on Hispanic and Native American uh, advocacy work that they've been doing. And I was wondering, um, since you're with Minority Hill, what have, I guess yours is a nonprofit? Are you with a nonprofit or with an agency? I'm not quite sure. Government's nonprofit. No. Um, okay. I'm with the federal government, so I work with the Department of Health and Human okay. Services for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay, so, so what advocacy have you seen and what policy changes have been made for uh, African American communities? Because we are always at the bottom uh, when it comes to health care. And I was just wondering what it, what it is that has been, what benefits we, we can see. Uh, from the minority health office. Yes, yeah, so that's a, a much longer conversation. So we are the, um, I direct the CMS Office of Minority Health. So we focus on racial and ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, people with disabilities in rural communities. So some of what we have been doing is going back to um, Ed's conversation about the data. So stratifying where we have disparities to lift up to be able to show um, how we can improve outcomes. We have implemented a program called um, From Coverage to Care to help educate consumers about their coverage and be able to connect to primary care and preventive services. We've translated that into seven languages and worked with community groups on those translations, but also to disseminate that information. Um, when you think about who the uninsured were uh, several years ago and still are, are disproportionately communities of color. Um, we also just in the past year and a half worked with um, Tom's office, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy on a chronic care management campaign that was specifically focused in rural communities and in communities of color to help educate them about chronic care management services for individuals, Medicare beneficiaries with multiple chronic conditions. Um, we also are working to improve our data collection so that we can document um, disparities better. Uh, we have also in the focus on social determinants um, looking at how we can capture more information on that. So we have actually just uh, proposed in our post-acute care rules that we collect information on the social determinants of health, health literacy, transportation needs, social isolation, language preference, race, ethnicity in um, health assessments for all of our patients in uh, post-acute care settings. Um, and I will stop there just because we don't have time, but happy to talk more afterwards. Mm -hmm. I just want to add that um, we've been working with a coalition of groups um, that includes the National Urban League and um, the Asian Pacific Islander Health Forum um, to look at desegregation of, of actual data and the importance of looking not only about race and ethnicity and language, but also different communities. I think that's extremely important. I know the woman who, who in the back who asked about research it's not just working with research universities and organizations, but also working with federal governments to encourage that you are looking at this disaggregated data, um, so then that you're being, being able to look much more deeper into key gaps in care. Um, we're also part of, and so is the NUL and a number of other minority health forum uh, is, is part of um, a bigger kind of effort uh, to uh, uh, related to precision medicine uh, called uh, uh, All of Us program uh, to try to get as many individuals into uh, you know this major initiative um, for us to be able to study our, our key community communities and the whole effort and the goal is to try to get at least 80 percent in terms of diversity and when I mean diversity I mean disability rural communities gender orientation race ethnicity more to more a very diverse thing so then that researchers and other areas are able to not only look at um, uh, individuals within their health the biologic but also in terms of the environment and, and our way of living. Back there. Yeah. Thank you. We've got a question from Twitter. Um, this is from a master's student and West Virginia native, Ashley Clark. And she asks, what are your strategies to promote Census 20, 2020 among the communities you serve? Good question. 
question. So every year, <clears throat> we, uh, the Center for Native American Youth produces what's called this. Produces what's called the State of Native Youth Report. And this year's theme is going to be the census and count and that sense of belonging and why that's so important. And <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we receive funding through um, a nonprofit that allows Native youth to go out and <clears throat> work on census. Um, this past year, we were able to fund eight youth in tribal communities to go out, uh, do work on census, voting polls, and all the other issues that are kind of going to be impacting them in the future. And the fact that youth are excited about the census is really cool. Um, you know, <laughs> and so no longer are they like, I don't know, we were working with this kid from Standing Rock and he was just like, I had to tell my grandma, no, it's okay, we can talk about all of our cousins and aunties that live with us because that's how the government funds us. And so <clears throat> just making sure that our youth are properly educated and um, I think the State of Native Youth Report, you'll see that this year. Uh, so for Unidos U.S., we're also part of a coalition um, related to the census. Um, as, as you could imagine, have you seen, uh, there's also, you know, a language in there in terms of asking for, uh, you know, uh, immigration status, um, which we're trying to fight as well. And um, at the same time, we're also educating our affiliate network. We have about nearly 300 community-based organizations, health centers, charter schools, uh, community development organizations uh, that are working to be part of of those conversations that are happening locally um, and uh, with, you know, get ready for the census. So there's going to be a lot more information and campaign efforts that you'll hear from us. Um, so make sure you follow us on Twitter or Facebook. That breakout time, this is not the first time I've heard about the census from this group as I've been moving around. So just throwing that out there. There was, did anybody else want to respond to that question? No. Can we get a mic to Javier? Um, kind of the same question I asked earlier about kind of like the gentrification of Woodward. You know, I, I, this is awesome because we're talking a lot of like really high level policy and this morning's conversation just seemed to be a lot more granular about what was actually happening on the ground and, and, and things that people were doing, actions, not just opinions. Um, and so that just got me to thinking you know, like in the near future technologically, we're probably all going to have internet, high-speed internet. I think I read that was it like 19 satellites were just put up in the space, or 36 satellites were just put in the space, and now anyone can get internet. I don't know how true that is. It was, it, it was, it wasn't a reputable um, uh, media outlet. It wasn't fake news. So, um, but, but I mean, just imagining this, and so I'm thinking about all the groups that are already marginalized that are living in rural areas, and, you know, as as this development comes, how. Can we t think two steps ahead? And I'm, I'm, I'm bouncing off of uh, uh, Ms. Jones, Ms. James' uh, comment about the unintentional consequences. So, how can we make sure that the ideas that we're coming up with will position the folks that are actually out there now to be able to take advantage of the improvements that may be coming? Um, you know, I, I, I was thinking a little bit about local economic development earlier, and and um, you know, the fact that I forget the lady, the, the author who was up there, and she was talking about the bread that they bought. They're growing wheat, but they're buying this bread that comes from somewhere else. Is, you know, how, how, can we, how can we work to make sure that the folks that live in an area are resourced so that they can have the same opportunities, equitable opportunities, not just in the first phase, but, you know, two, three generations down? I don't, yeah, know, if I that made, I don't know if that made sense. That's the $64,000 question, right? I mean, who's at the table? How, how did they get a seat at the table? What did it take? Uh, so I don't, I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of work around trying to pass the right sort of policies about who, who, who has access and affordability to the internet, you know, blah, 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 and it's still a question of power, right? I think, was it um, 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 Brian who said earlier, right, it's about who is at the table? And I don't, I don't know. 
So um, since we're getting the stop sign, I would just say that part of it is making sure that we are engaging with them in the development of the solutions. So some of what, um, just as a quick example, we're looking at how we can utilize some of our innovation funding to help rural communities transform. And we've been listening to those rural communities so that we're developing a program that works for them as opposed to us having a top-down approach of here's what we're going to do and here's what you need to fit into. I think in terms of those resources, part of it is also how do you connect to the communities to let them know that the opportunities are coming or that the opportunities are there because we tend to utilize, and I'll just say, you know, we tend to utilize our listserv and people aren't, I mean, are on our listserv who, who are in the communities. So how do we reach them through the channels that are existing and partner with them so that they know about the opportunities and can take advantage of them and connect people to that? So like the RHI hub is a place where people can come together to learn about what's happening and how you can build some of those bridges to stre strengthen those partnerships. Mm -hmm. Did you all want to weigh in before we... Mm -hmm. Just yeah. <laughs> I think I always go back to investing in, in communities, investing in, in a lot of times people forget about community-based organizations, uh, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I also think about investing in our youth. You know, we, we do have a coding uh, uh, a pro new program for, for middle school kids, you know, of teaching, them how, teaching them how to code. Um, whether we have that in rural communities is a different story. I have to go back and check. Um, but the other thing that happened, you know, with recently with the, the hurricanes, with Hurricane Harvey and Maria and Irma, um, we, with our Healthy and Ready for the Future initiative, you know, we started hearing from our communities that, um, there was a lot of infrastructure that, that was affected um, not only within Florida, but also that they were also seeing a lot of migrants coming from Puerto Rico into these rural, rural communities that they didn't even know how to live in, you know, because it's Minnesota. Uh, and so um, we invested monies and redirected funds to be able to support our community-based organizations in those areas. So I think I go back always to our communities and listening to them, hearing from them, what is the future look like um, having them having a place at the table is 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 critically important I love the fact that um, the foundation put Serena a youth advocate in at the table at in front of us you know to hear about what is her story and how do we dig deeper in that space what we heard from Serena and we won't and just like that Wonder Bread example I won't forget that it's crystallized now and I think that whole thing about the problem articulated um, is halfway toward the solution. That's a big part of it for listening, for listening for it. Thank you all. I think we have to move on. Thank you.